people to control each other. At least real sheep need a bloody sheepdog to keep them in line. We do it to ourselves. And the only way a few can control the many is if the many police each other. And that's what's happening. What this manipulation wants to do is to keep us in like an eggshell. We are multidimensional infinity. We are all that is, all that ever was or ever will be. We are just all. But if you can keep, and this is what the manipulation is about at the bottom line, foundation level, as we get into this afternoon. If you um, open to that infinite level of yourself, you are in the world, but you are not of it. Your point of perceiving this reality is not in the fog. It's here, looking through from another level. And you perceive the world in a completely different way because your point of observation is different. What they want to do, and what it's all aimed at doing, whether it's food additives, uh, chemicals in the water, electromagnetic pollution, uh, manipulation by uh, false information. It's to keep us in the vibrational box so we are uh, operating overwhelmingly on the five sense level of reality. The reality that they manipulate by controlling the information flows within the five sense reality. How do we get out of here? We're already out of here. We just have to remember and remove what we've thrown around ourselves to, to disconnect us. One of the ways they, uh, they do it is through education. I love education. I wish we had some. Um, <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember Gandhi? Um, he said, uh, when he was asked what he thought of Western civilization, he said, I think it would be a very good idea. And uh, I think education would be a very good idea. What they do in the education system is all part of keeping us in this box, keeping us from the, all the knowledge that's available they want to turn us into left brain prisoners. The left brain is that intellect, logic, basically five cents version of the world. Right brain, inspiration, creativity, connection. They want to keep us in, the, in, in here. So what they do in the education system is they use the old carrot and stick. Um, what the education system does, it very uh, succinctly, is it says to you, pour that information that we're giving you, in there, hold it there, me darling. And when someone says, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, you have uh, two hours to complete this paper, please pick up your pens, then we want the bugger back, right there, right? It's called passing exams. Now, how do you um, progress within the system? By passing exams, by telling people uh, the system what it wants to hear. Isn't it interesting? that you go up the secret society levels by degrees. And they give you a degree if you're good at education. I'm sure there's a connection there. Um, so if you do that, oh, Johnny's doing ever so well at school, you must be proud of him. Oh yes, he's ever so indoctrinated, I'm ever so pleased. <laughs> but if you rip it in there, and then rip it over there and have a look at it, it's a shit. And you, and you tell the exam paper that, or you tell the teacher that, Mrs. Smith, we have a problem with Jimmy. What's the problem? He's asking questions, and we're going to do it. You are a problem child. Give him Ritalin. Ask him questions. Ritalin. Get the child, you get the adult. That's the idea. As Mencken said again, the most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself. Almost inevitably, he comes to the conclusion that the government he lives under is dishonest, insane, and intolerable. Ain't that the truth? The idea, the idea of the system from cradle to grave is to stop us sussing that. So, keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, don't rock the boat, as they say in Japan, don't be the nail that stands out above the rest, because that's the first one to get hit. And you'll be fine.
You question us, you speak your truth, bad monkey, no banana. <laughs> and this is the way it works, and this is why that this time we're in is the time to play the bad monkey. Bugger the sodden banana. Now, this is the dual information flow that we see in the world all the time. People say, why does Blair and Bush and Rumsfeld and Wolford, why do they lie all the time? Well, they lie all the time because they're selling us a cover story. They can't tell us the truth. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I just want you to know that we want to create an Orwellian state. We want to microchip to every child at birth. And um, we um, want to have concentration camps in America. Thank you. Good night. Um, we ain't going to say it, are they? Oh, oh, by the way, forgot to tell you, we orchestrated 9-11 and the London bombings. Yeah, okay, see you, bye. It's not going to happen. So, they have to hide it with what I call the movie. The movie that we see and what passes for journalism on the television news and in the newspapers. Hiding the secret agenda of what's really going on by explaining things away with lies and deceit. It was 19, 19 Islams who did it. I know George Bush said, I've never, by the way, I've never once ever sussed that these people are, are believing all this stuff. Um, it is now documented fact that high that they lied to us about weapons of mass destruction and the reason for going into Iraq. <sighs> The same people who did that told us the official story of 9-11. Are they going to tell us the truth about that and lie about that? I mean, are they selective liars? No. They lie all the time. <laughs> and they have to for this reason. Now, what I'm going to do today, because there's different levels of observing this, and they're all connected. I'm going to talk about the five cents level for quite a time, because that directly affects us in terms of the daily manipulation we see in this uh, so-called physical reality. And then I'm going to go on to talk about other levels of it. Basically, in this five cents level of reality, this is how they want to manifest the control. They want a world government that will make all the major decisions in the world and it would control a world central bank, a world currency that wouldn't be cash or physical money in any way. It would only be electronic money for which there are fundamental implications for freedom. If uh, you hand over your electronic money now and that machine says no, you can still pay cash. When there's no cash and it says no, you have no means of purchase. That's the idea. They want a world army to impose the will of the world government. And they want this microchip population I talked about. Under that, they want four super states. The European Union, we're there. The American Union, look what's happening now, this CAFTA thing and all the rest expanding uh, into the American Union. Pacific Union, Asia, Pacific Economic Cooperation, they want to expand that out of, their version of the European, uh, European Common Market as well. And the African Union uh, changed its name to that from the Organization of African Unity some years ago, and that's what they want. Under that, nation states and regions will be little more than county councils now, and under that, the people. Then there's the other level, which we'll get into this afternoon, the interdimensional level, where this reality, which is only a tiny, tiny frequency range that human sight can access, this reality is being manipulated through these, this network of secret societies and their bloodline families from beyond this reality. We'll get into that. And then we'll go on to the fact that it's, uh, that's the matrix I'm talking about with that in terms of that, onto the fact that it's all an illusion. And if it's an illusion, we can change it. We just change the illusion from a prison to a paradise by realizing we have that power. Get into that this afternoon. In short, infinite love is the only truth. The existence of one infinite consciousness is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. The imagination of that consciousness made manifest. 
So, what we're going to do now in this five cents level, because what they're doing, what they're doing all the time is that, okay? No, don't look, don't look, don't look here, no, 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 right? And, and these two uh, lady peacocks, it's always the fellas, isn't it, that strut around, have you noticed that? Um, these two lady peacocks are saying, cut the crap and show us your willy. And when you do that with this manipulation, it's, it's not a pretty sight. So, level one, and we're going to be going through quite a lot of this into the afternoon, the five cents conspiracy that is unfolding. And this morning before lunch, I'm going to go into some of the history of it and the esoteric nature of it, the knowledge that they have that they keep from people. Now, whether it's 9-11 or whether it's the nature of reality, this is the structure that is um, seen throughout. Anywhere you go, you see this structure. The few hoard knowledge, advanced knowledge, secret knowledge, in the hands of the few, and they pass it across the highest levels of the secret society network, while structuring society to keep people in ignorance of that knowledge. Indeed, to get a lot of people so confused that they attack people down here who say they know what that knowledge is. And they manipulate um, not just information, but they nip manipulate wealth by sucking that into the top of the pyramid and keeping the people um, in a state of need overwhelmingly. And that's a very simple equation. We live in a world of incredible abundance. Africa, Africa can't feed itself. Please, it could feed the world. The reason Africa doesn't feed itself is because vast tracts of food growing land are growing cash crops for the Western transnational corporations and other vast, vast tracts of food growing land are no-go areas because of manipulated wars. That's why it can't feed. We must help Africa. No, you must get off its bloody back. Then we might have a chance of doing something. <laughs> the equation of which Africa is a classic is abundance equals choice equals freedom, scarcity equals dependency equals control. And that's why right across society, global society, we have manipulated uh, shortages, manipulated therefore dependency, manipulated control. That's a wonderful uh, statement by Catherine Bertini, food is power, we use it to change behavior, some may call that bribery, we do not apologize. Manipulated scarcity to bring about control. Same with money, which is figures on a screen anyway. So that's the structure that's going to follow us all the way through um, today. That's the structure on which everything is based. And this didn't start yesterday. I mean, what's, um, what I did when I first started understanding this, I wrote a book called I'm the Truth to Set You Free, which is pretty much about the last 200 years of this uh, manipulation. And I started to ask the obvious question. When did this start? Because it was clear this structure couldn't be put together in a few years or even a few decades. It had to go back a long way. And it clearly, um, there were some answers far back to be found. So I started going back and I got comfortably back to the time of the Crusades in what, the 1200s? And then back into the, the BC era before you're picking up any kind of a start to this story. And that's not really the start, it's just the place where you can pick it up. Now, what I've more and more understood is that somewhere in what we call prehistory, in this reality anyway, because we can talk about time and its non-existence, but in this reality we're talking about now, um, there was a global society and a global knowledge. And something happened that destroyed that unity and the knowledge became isolated all over the world. 
And what happened was that this knowledge then went its own way and people in the different isolated parts used different symbology, they used different names for symbolic deities, but it was the same basic knowledge um, and people talk about Atlantis and maybe that was the time when this uh, society broke up and uh, became uh, fragmented. Now a few weeks ago now, I spent 10 days with this man, a, a Zulu shaman called Krader Mutwa, his 84th birthday this week. Amazing, amazing human being. And he uh, is the official historian of the Zulu nation and what this man doesn't know um, almost isn't worth knowing in terms of um, uh, esoteric knowledge and also the history that I'm talking about. And funny enough, uh, he took me to a place uh, where there's this amazing foot, a, a perfect human foot, because of the African sun you can't see the toes, but they're perfect, which should be in this, uh, I think it's granite, which goes back vast, vast amounts of time. Uh, where did that foot come from? Um, uh, no one seems to know. Funnily enough, um, just as a quick aside, I had to bloody laugh. What they do, in, what they did in Africa, South Africa, is when the, the Dutch and the British came, they kept a lot of the names of places that were the original African names, right? And the, the little town right next to where this is, is, is a Zulu name. And Credo said to me, he said, do you know what that, ta that word means? He said, no, he said, I said it means um, a woman's female organ. That's what it means. And I thought, are you going to tell the mayor or me? You know what I mean? <laughs> Where do you come from? Uh, woman's female organ. Well, get it, let me go. <laughs> anyway, what, um, what he, what he, he, he um, did for me was throw the bones. These are carved animal bones going back hundreds of years, these. And he, he threw the bones, asked me to put my uh, hands over them first, and then he read them. And he was so accurate, it was unbelievable. And I sat there and I thought, that's nothing more than throwing the rune stones or reading the tarot cards. In other words, the same knowledge, the same understanding is all over the world. You go to a, uh, an Indian holy man or a Zulu shaman or shaman in South America, in the Native America, whatever, you are getting the same knowledge, it's just expressed in a different way. And uh, what has happened is that this network of interbreeding families connected to these other dimensional entities I'll get into this afternoon have sought to do two things when that global society broke up, which they may well have been involved in. And one is to hoard the knowledge that existed then in the way I've described in the um, upper levels of the secret society network and secondly to suck that knowledge out of circulation everywhere else and they did this, they used magnificently Christianity when they went in the Spanish and the British and the French went into the Americas uh, and also into South, South Africa. Uh, Craig and Mutwa summed it up brilliantly when he said, when the British came into Africa, he said, they milked the minds of the shaman and then killed them. And that's why that African knowledge had to go underground in its own secret society network, uh, which is where Craig and Mutwa got hold of it. So, it's not an accident that this esoteric knowledge and this knowledge of the nature of life and reality has been uh, sucked out of society for so long. I mean, look at the Inquisition. That was a classic expression of what I'm talking about. It's because if you have the knowledge and the people don't, you are in a massive, massive position of power over the people. I'll get into this this afternoon, but what if they know there how we create reality and the mass of the people don't? We are putty in the hands of those who know how to manipulate us to manipulate our reality. So, hello? From this time, Atlantis, whatever it was, this time when the global society broke up, the stream of knowledge has come down through this Illuminati network, Illuminati, illuminated ones, illuminated into the knowledge the rest of us don't get. 
um, right down to the present day, which is why, as we'll see this morning, um, the Illuminati and the people of power and the organizations of power today are awash with the symbolism of this knowledge as they've hoarded for themselves and sucked out of um, uh, circulation. This is um, supposedly uh, the seal of Atlantis. It's the ring of power. It's found on some uh, relief images. This is supposed to be the, 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 the ring of power in Atlantis and also um, other parts of the world. This is how the Republicans set up Bush at one of their conventions. Accident? You must be joking. Um, they understand the nature of reality, not Bush, he doesn't know what his name is, I'm talking about the people that, 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 that behind the scenes that really control. They understand the nature of reality and the nature of this matrix and how to manipulate it to keep people in mental, emotional and physical prisons. The ring of power. Massive symbolism. Uh, Georgie, Georgie and these controlling bloodlines are not what they appear to be. And um, they've not just carried knowledge down through this period I'm talking about. They've carried a genetic code also, which I'll get into this afternoon. Now, as we move towards the present day from the time that that global society became fragmented, we can seriously pick up this story in Babylon and bring it through to the present day. Babylon was one of the great, the great ancient center at that period of the Illuminati, its bloodlines, its methods of operation, its secret societies, everything. And these bloodlines and everything they took with them moved out of Babylon and eventually across the world. Babylon, uh, in what is now, of course, Iraq, the land between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's the place also of that very advanced ancient culture of uh, Sumer. And people talk in history about Sumer being the cradle of civilization. No, no. That was a place where the knowledge came to the surface and was expressed after the breakup of the global uh, society and the global knowledge. And going into Iraq is not just about oil. This is a very, very sacred place in the history of the Illuminati, Babylon. So these uh, bloodlines and their network moved their headquarters eventually to Rome. And that's when we had the Roman Empire. When you follow uh, the Illuminati bloodlines in terms of its headquarters, you follow the great empires of history. Um, it was in Rome that they founded the Roman Church, which was nothing more than the Roman version of the Church of Babylon, as we will see, carrying the knowledge hidden in code, given a cover story that people think is a religion of a certain kind, when actually it's a cover for this knowledge I'm talking about. Eventually they moved up to Britain and Europe and then all over the world. And still today, London is a massive centre, not Tony Blair, but the centre of the secret society network on a um, operational level. And thanks to the British Empire and these other empires, the French Empire, but particularly the British, out from here, the bloodlines and the secret society network went, carrying this knowledge, carrying this great work of the ages to take the planet over, and now we're seeing it um, coming to what they believe is fruition, the great work of the ages, the Illuminati bloodlines. One of the um, things that I, I began to understand as I started to go back looking for some kind of start to this, I realized that for some reason, I didn't know why at the time, um, these um, Illuminati families were obsessed with interbreeding, like all, keeping the genes up. All the royal families interbreed, but it's, it's bigger than that. Um, why? Why this obsession with genetics that they have? So um, as I went back, uh, you can start to pick up 
these Illuminati bloodlines that came through what we call history to the present day and under different names, they're the ones that end up in the positions of power. We're like being controlled by a genetic tribe. This is not a racial in the sense of a country or a single race. It's like operates through all races and all peoples. Um, and the, the, the na nature of that I'll get into, like I say, this afternoon. Now this is from various um, genealogical sources and it's a, work, it's a work in progress. But you can follow bloodlines coming down from ancient Egypt and Sumer and the Phoenicians, Babylon and that ancient world down through Philip of Macedonia whose son Alexander the Great took over a vast swathe of that blue and white map that I saw before he died in Babylon at the age of 32, 33 I think. Comes down through the Roman and Egyptian royal bloodlines, but down through uh, Herod the Great and the Gospel stories, down through Constantine the Great, the Roman Emperor of course, who at the Council of Nicaea in what was it, 325 AD, um, brought in the creed that still today is the basis of the Christian religion. He wasn't even a Christian. Um, it comes down through the Merovinians. The Merovinian uh, kings in France, or what we now call France, um, a very, very important bloodline to the Illuminati. And it comes up again and again and again. And I was kind of interested in the, the Matrix movies that the gatekeeper was um, uh, portrayed as a Frenchman called the Merovinian. I thought that was very uh, appropriate, the nature of the, the Merovinian bloodline that they uh, are, are so keen to preserve. Because this um, DNA structure, again I'll get into this this afternoon in some detail, but when it, it breeds, it's bred outside of itself, it dilutes quickly. But there's a certain code they want to keep for reasons I'll come to. It comes down through Charlemagne, uh, the most famous monarch of, again, what we now call France. Charlemagne, um, uh, his uh, 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 kind of uh, family line goes into many, many famous people today, not least many American presidents. Um, this is a um, statue of Charlemagne next to the Notre Dame Cathedral, Our Lady, Our Lady, we'll get to that in a second, um, in Paris. Comes down through the Habsburgs out of Austria who ruled the Holy Roman Empire for centuries. Down through the de' Medici family, a major family in Italy, and down through the House of Lorraine in the German uh, France uh, border areas there, Lorraine. And that's still a significant bloodline to the Illuminati today, keeping this genetic code going. And how I, uh, appropriate that the double cross is the symbol of the House of Lorraine. They must have been psychic as well, someone must have been. It comes down through the French royal dynasties and down to Marie Antoinette and the French kings and it comes down into the royal families of Britain right down to the present one. And, uh, this is the, the bloodline that has gone out across the world. And what has happened is, instead of being overtly in control through royalty, kings and queens, as the people started to demand more and more um, uh, fairness in the way they were ruled and more and more say, these bloodlines went out of overt royalty into controlling the banking system and the political system and transnational corporations, etc., and the media. It comes down to American presidents. Anyone can become president of the United States, oh yeah. If they've got the right bloodline, they've got a chance, yeah. Uh, and uh, again, in so many ways, the, the American presidency is just as much a royal dynasty as anything you find in Europe, including the Bush family. Um, Boy George and his father, it's a dynasty. It's not an accident that, that uh, Prescott Bush was a major force in um, uh, politics of his time, the, the, the grandfather of the present president. He uh, brings along Father George, who is in major positions of power, including president, and then the village idiot becomes president. I mean, anyone can be. Because of their bloodline and they're the chosen one, they can get into power, even though they shouldn't be let um, anywhere near anything more dangerous than a Lego set. <laughs> Put down that Lego, George. Come and make a speech. I want my Lego, Dad. Would you buy a used car from those eyes? I don't think so. This is another uh, possible genetics background to George. I am persuaded. 
I am persuaded that this is an alternative genetic tree <laughs> with the greatest respect to monkeys, you know. <laughs> Comes down through the Scottish, many of the Scottish blo aristocratic bloodline families. Um, Scotland's a really, really important uh, place uh, uh, to the uh, Illuminati in so many ways. It's not an accident, it's called the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, one of the, ma the, the major Freemasonic um, uh, um, network. Comes down through um, people like uh, Maximilian, Emperor of, ne of Mexico, down through the Rothschilds and Rockefellers and out into the institutions that control global society. Now, of course, the God program has been fundamental to keeping the knowledge out of public circulation and sucking it out where it is there. Like I say, the Inquisition. And what you find is that all these different religions are actually basically controlled by the same force. Because what the religions are there to do is go zoom with our sense of possibility. Um, and I, there's many uh, people in the conspiracy research movement who are doing a fantastic job. Hold my hand up to them. Anyone that takes this on and communicates this, I hold my hand up to them. Fantastic. But they think I'm a bit weird in some areas. Um, and the reason they think I'm a bit weird is because I don't have their religious belief. And because they, so many have a religious belief, they edit possibility on the basis of that belief and therefore they'll go so far but no further because their religious belief is in trouble if they go further and where they, what they find is actually turning out to be true. So the God program, <laughs> the God program and the religions were created to hold people in this mental, emotional servitude. Don't look there, it's the devil! <laughs> right? Now, that's why you find so many of these religions were founded by the bloodline. Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormons, at least um, publicly he was, the people behind him, of course, Merovinian bloodline. Brigham Young, who took it on, Merovinian bloodline. And the key, one of the key, anyway, symbols of the Merovinian bloodline going way, way back is the beehive, or the bee. And, of course, the Utah state seal, this wholly owned subsidiary of the Mormon church, Utah, right at the center of it, is the bee or the beehive, the Merovinian symbol. Why? Because they're behind the Mormons. Change. Charles Ch Taze Russell, one of the founders of the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Merovinian bloodline. He's buried under a pyramid somewhere in America. And it's not just me, it's this guy Fritz Frit Springmeier, last I heard he was still in jail. Um, um, Fritz Springmeier, he's done a, a lot of research on the bloodlines of the Illuminati, and um, he's um, paid quite a price for it, it would seem. Now, as these um, bloodlines moved through history, like I say, um, and expanded, with them went the great empires. First of all, the Babylonian Empire, then the Roman Empire and, and, and the Roman Church, then into uh, Britain, where they uh, focused their headquarters, not least the secret society called the Knights Templar that is behind Tony Blair, um, and uh, then they expanded across the world uh, where they are today. And what they took with them all through this period was this structure. It's very simple and devastatingly effective. It's pyramids within pyramids, like Russian dolls, one doll inside a bigger doll inside a bigger doll. So, you'll have a bank that is a pyramid. Only a few at the top of the bank know what the real agenda and, and uh, you know, projection forward uh, and agenda of that bank is. The further you come down from that capstone of the bank, you've got more and more people in the bank, working every day, knowing less and less and less about what that bank's agenda really is. That bank then goes into um, 
the, uh, the banking uh, global network of that particular individual bank, not that there is such a thing, and then eventually there's a pyramid that encompasses the whole banking system. And at the top of that are these interbreeding Illuminati families. A transnational corporation is a compartmentalized pyramid, um, and it goes into the transnational corporation global pyramid, and at the uh, peak of that, all the transnational corporations are controlled by the same people. And it's the same with the oil cartel, with politics, the whole shebang, including the pharmaceutical cartel, intelligence agencies. When you get to the top of Mossad, and the top of the CIA, and at the top of British intelligence, at the controlling level, they're basically one organization. Although people down the bottom of that organization will not be aware of that. Again, it's about having as few people as possible knowing in awareness what's going on and the rest are just pawns in the game. And it's staggering when you look at it how few people you need to control an organization. Um, look at the American government. Um, the money people in the shadows um, put the president in power. Through him, not from him, he um, dictates to his heads of uh, the State Department, of the Defense Department, the Treasury, whatever, and then they control those departments of state. And everyone else, like, it's like the Pentagon. What do people, in, most people in the Pentagon do every day? They follow the policy dictated from the top. Control the top, you control the pyramid. This is how it works. This is why you can go really, really high in politics, even into cabinet ministers in Britain, and they haven't got a clue what they're actually part of and what's actually going on. And that's how they, they do it, and um, it's devastatingly effective. So, in effect, what you've got is a one force, and it's manipulating what appears to us in the public arena as different sides or different organizations. Um, and this is the movie, this is the agenda that we saw earlier. You can also symbolize it as a spider's web. You've got the elite in the center of the web and then the strands go out. The further away from the spider you are, the less you know about the agenda. Around there is where you find the people that are really orchestrating this whole um, network of control. And like I said earlier, the, the main way they do it is to create the prison without the bars, to give us the impression that we are free so we do nothing about the fact that we're not. And again, South Africa is a great example. I spent a lot of time in South Africa over the years. And before um, uh, majority rule, we had apartheid. Now, there's two forms of control. One that has a finite life and one that can go on forever until it's exposed. The finite life is the in-your-face, touch, taste, um, see dictatorship. Uh, fascism, communism, apartheid. Because the people being controlled know they're controlled. They're not under any illusion. And eventually, the desire for freedom will, and it might take some time, express itself and uh, bring an end to it. That is of nothing compared with the power of control of the prison without the bars. The prison you cannot see, touch and taste because you'll sit in the prison forever not realizing you're in there. And so what um, happened in South Africa, it's very symbolic of what's happened all around the world with the uh, independence given to countries like uh, the United States and others around the world, is that um, they had in South Africa apartheid, in your face dictatorship, no secret. The black majority completely controlled, no say, the white few control. At that time, the uh, gold and mining industry and the other great industries of uh, South Africa were controlled by the Oppenheimer family, the bloodline branch managers, as I call them, like the Rockefellers and people like that are in America, of the Illuminati, their job is to control their sphere of influence and manipulate so that the, um, there is a global pattern in every country. Um, 
and you had the Oppenheimer family controlling the economy. 80% of the stock on the South African stock market was apparently controlled by the Oppenheimer family and its network. Then we moved from apartheid to black majority rule. A vote for everyone. And on the surface, things changed. What basically changed is that black people could do that every four or five years. And in fact, bring in another one-party state, which has turned out. Um, and but what really changed? What has really changed in South Africa? You hear and Mutua talk about this. Nothing. Because after this move, and of course, at this time, there were protests. Hey, it's, it's not fair, apartheid, injustice, and quite rightly. But then when we moved to black majority rule and they brought Mandela in as president, now that he's got this Thabo and Becky guy, all the banners went down and they said, oh great, South Africa's free now, brilliant. Still today, the Oppenheimer family and its network controls, owns the South African economy. And the vast majority of, of stock on the South African stock market, and it dictates to the uh, black government, just like it dictated to the white government. As a journalist said to me, he said, when I was over there years ago, he said, I don't know if what you're saying is right about all this stuff, but I'll tell you this, I know for a fact. Mandela never made a single, single major economic decision without talking to Ari Oppenheimer first. Now this is the way they have replaced in-your-face dictatorship with a dictatorship you can't see masquerading as freedom. And it's about time we woke up to it before it completely engulfs us. Now, the Illuminati Secret Society Network. As these bloodlines have moved through history and expanded, so their Secret Society Network has gone with them for a simple reason. It's their role to manipulate their placemen uh, into positions of power so they control the system. And to manipulate uh, other people into being pawns in a game they don't understand. And uh, again, how is the secret society structured exactly as they have structured our society? By levels of knowledge. The vast majority of Freemasons in the world never get higher than the bottom three levels of degree, the so-called blue degrees. And as you go up, they tell you a different story and a different story and a different story until you get to the 33rd degree. And even most Freemasons don't realize there are two 33rd degrees. There's one where that's as far as you go, because that's the official top of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. There's another 33rd degree involving the bloodline and the chosen ones that go through that into the next level, which are the Illuminati degrees, which are also broken up into levels of knowledge. And all these major secret societies are funneling people out the top, symbolically, into this upper level, the chosen few. And it's there... Not here, overwhelmingly, it's there that the real game is played. And they follow through, like I say, with the symbology of the knowledge that has been hoarded while it's been sucked out of society. This is a, a, a book, Children of Moo, um, by uh, James Churchwood. Uh, it was supposed to be Lemuria, is another name given to it. Another um, ancient society of, of high uh, knowledge and advancement. And what Church would claim is that he had seen um, accounts and tablets tens of thousands of years old in isolated monasteries in Asia. And uh, these were some of the symbols that he found on them. The swastika. The Nazis, who were Illuminati uh, uh, operation, um, used the swastika because they were an uh, 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 esoteric, what people would call a cult um, operation. It was structured like that. They manipulated the people using that knowledge. This is um, now the Maltese cross, which is the symbol of the Knights of Malta, one of the major secret societies still uh, manipulating today. A lot of top uh, American politicians, including Ronald Reagan, were Knights of Malta. Uh, this one will become significant as we go along. These, this is an example of the knowledge passing through these Illuminati bloodlines, and the significance of that will become um, much more obvious when we get into the nature of reality this afternoon. So again, the Maltese cross, the Knights of Malta, um, uh, a very ancient symbol. One of the most significant of these secret uh, societies is called the Knights Templar. And their um, symbol, going way back to the Crusades and all that time, 
is the red cross on the white background, which is now, and has for a long time been, the flag of England. Of course, because when you look behind the scenes, in places like Temple Bar in London, the centre of the global um, law uh, network of manipulation, you find that it is controlled by the Knights Templar. Tony Blair came through uh, to be a lawyer through that Temple Bar system controlled by the Knights Templar. And that's who uh, dictates to him out of, um, out of London. That's where the real power is, not in Downing Street. Again, it's where the, the, the Templar um, symbol. Now, just to give you an example of how this, this secret society has passed through history, I'll just follow for a, a few minutes uh, the passage of the, the Knights Templar. Um, they are one of the strands, a very significant strand in the network that is um, pursuing the great work, the great work of planetary control, the Orwellian society. The Knights Templar's official story is that they were formed in the 11 1200s to protect pilgrims going to Jerusalem. And there were nine of these knights to start with, and uh, they were supposed to protect pilgrims around Jerusalem. They ain't going to protect many pilgrims. It was a cover story. What they did was, they came out of um, France originally, and down into uh, Jerusalem. And they parked themselves next to what is Temple Mount, where the big mosque is today. And after a, a, a number of years, nine years or so, um, suddenly things began to uh, move very rapidly. A couple of them came back to France and they started signing up the major um, aristocratic families of Europe. And to join the Templars, you have to give them the, your money and, and land and wealth and stuff. And they were signing um, uh, lots of people up to the point where they became... Uh, an incredibly uh, powerful and uh, rich operation. Eventually, in, uh, and, and in many ways, today's banking system, where you lend people money that doesn't exist and charge them interest on it, that goes back, that's what the Templars did, that was their modus operandi. Um, eventually, in 1307, the King of France, Philip the Fair, who seemed to have been anything but, um, he was up to his neck in debt to the Templars, as were... were uh, many of the, the rulers of Europe, exactly today where the governments of the world are up to their neck in debt to the banking system, that is merely the modern version of this, uh, controlled by the same secret societies. Philip the Fair um, had a purge of the Templars, and um, Jacques de Molay, their leader, was, uh, was, was killed. Uh, but a lot of the Templars knew it was coming, and they got away. And they had a big fleet of ships by this time doing their trading, a massive operation. And they escaped in two directions, almost certainly three. The almost certainly was to North America, where um, way before Columbus they knew, and uh, John Cab Cabot, they knew um, that America existed and this land existed. The other place as they went, definitely, was round the west coast of Ireland and into Scotland, where they later re-manifested as the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, in one expression. And another place they went was down here to Portugal, where they um, hid behind a front uh, name called the Knights of Christ. And one of their most famous uh, Grand Masters was a guy called Henry the Navigator, who is significant to America because um, one of his sea captains, very close to him, was the father-in-law of Christopher Columbus. So Christopher Columbus wasn't looking for India and went, ooh, what's this? They had the maps. Uh, as, as we've seen in recent uh, times, where maps have come to light, one of which, I think it was a guy called Piri Reis from the uh, Ottoman Turkish uh, Navy, he uh, drew a map um, of what the landmass looked like under Antarctica, which has been confirmed by sonar and all these modern techniques to be remarkably accurate. And he did this, I think it was in the 15 bloody hundreds, um, not long after Columbus went on his trip. Um, so they, again, the secret knowledge and what the people think is um, known. Very different. Um, one of the, when they went, the, the Templars, around into Scotland, um, they, like I say, became the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, and this was one, and still is in many ways, one of their holy 
Grails. It's called Rosslyn Chapel, not far from Edinburgh. In fact, uh, Dolly the sheep, the first cloned sheep, actually uh, all that went on at the Rosslyn Institute just down the road from this. As you can see, the uh, original ancient um, scaffolding still there. It's remarkable the way it's, um, it's preserved. Now, the reason I show you this is because inside Rosslyn Chapel are depictions of uh, uh, cactus plants and aloe plants and other plants that were only known to exist um, in the United States, in America, and, and uh, this continent. And this chapel was built and that stonework put in many, many years before Columbus went on its journey and any official discovery of America was found. In fact, there's a very rare book um, written by, I think it's a Canadian guy, who um, uh, charts the way that uh, the Sinclair family, a guy called um, uh, Henry Sinclair, um, from the Sinclair family that uh, is based at Rosslyn Chapel, or built Rosslyn Chapel and was based at Rosslyn Castle, that he landed in New England in something like 1398, the best part of a hundred years before Columbus. Again, secret official story, very, very different. And so, when they d discovered officially the Americas, there came a point in the great work when it was time to take it over. And they got, had Columbus, um, who, as the Freemasonic historian Manly P. Hall has um, detailed in his books, operated out of Genoa in the same secret society network as a man called Giovanni Cabotto, who history knows as John Cabot. What a coincidence that two people from the same secret society network in Genoa, one discovers the American continent in what was it, 1492? And four or five years later, another initiate of that network discovers North America. Stands back in amazement. Coincidences are and extraordinary. Um, and what then followed was um, the movement of peoples into the Americas and the bloodlines. Uh, this guy, uh, Francis Bacon, again, one of the uh, a big initiate of this network, um, wrote a book called The New Atlantis in which he was uh, clearly referring to the uh, New Americas uh, that where they had well planned. And a lot of the early founding fathers were Freemasons um, and bloodline. Um, and uh, they brought in the secret society uh, network uh, with them. Uh, and uh, after that, we um, had the, the network that we have today expanded into the control of North America. Now, one of them, of course, was Benjamin Franklin, who brought the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry into America in many ways. And um, interestingly, this is a, a newspaper report from some years ago when they had a grant, I think it's 1.5 million pounds or something, to uh, renovate Franklin's former home near Trafalgar Square in London. And uh, this newspaper report it is, is explaining that when they dug the floors up, they found ten bodies, six of them children, that had had all drills and stuff done to them. And... Uh, they had dated them to the time that Franklin uh, was there. And uh, they're saying here that he and his uh, housemate must have been into uh, grave snatching for medical research. When you find um, and start to realize what these bloodlines are into in terms of human sacrifice, still to this day among the most famous people in the world, some of them, then uh, there could well be another explanation for why there were all those bodies under the floor at Franklin's house. So, we had the uh, War of Independence, which when you look at the way it went, the, the British lost it on purpose. And the reason they lost it on purpose, not the soldiers, but the people orchestrating it, was because what we were doing here was moving from in-your-face dictatorship, colonial rule, to the prison without the bars that have gone on ever since. And the first um, president was an aristocratic British bloodline, 
and uh, George Washington was also a high Freemason. In fact, the first inauguration of uh, a president um, in America, the Washington inauguration, was a Freemasonic ritual from start to finish. And in fact, boy George, when he swore the oath of office, laughing inside, I'm sure, he swore it on the Bible from the, I think it was the New York Freemasonic Lodge, the same one that this guy did. Um, you know, he's been, obviously been doing the washing up look. And it's funny, put my apron on, do some washing up. Dear Freemason, wash the dishes. Um, this is uh, Washington's uh, Masonic apron. There's the sun, which will become very significant um, shortly. And again, because you've got this situation where one force is controlling both sides, you have strange things like George Washington, who fought against the power of British royalty, was a member of the um, Order of the Garter, which is an elite grouping around British monarch. Benjamin Franklin uh, was a very close associate of um, the British royal family um, when he was based in London and also in Paris. It's because there is a cover story going on where the face says one thing and underneath something else is going on. Now, when we were in that... Um, Freemasonic uh, Holy Grail place in Boston. Uh, one of the pictures that we took was um, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, honorary Grand Master Order de Molay, Jacques de Molay, the head of the Knights Templar, the Grand Master, who was taken out by Philip the Fair. This is a, a strand that goes through um, history. Uh, same with these guys. These are uh, members of the same secret society network, the same uh, web. And what they've done, as we've moved through to the present day, is they've created basically global Babylon. And, like I say, they moved out of here and they took with them, across the world, the Babylonian system, right across the world. And... Everywhere you look, it comes back to Babylon. First of all, Christianity. What happened is, the Babylon religion relocated to Rome and became the Roman church. That's why the Christian holy days match the holy days of Babylon. Um, and so much more that I'll come to. The basis of Judaism was written after the captivity in Babylon. So much of Islam accepts the truth of Christianity and Judaism um, uh, uh, in many ways. The banking system, lending people money that doesn't exist, charging them interest on it. The credit system, that goes back to Babylon and can be followed through like with the Knights Templar on its way through to the present day. Systems of government, secret societies and their codes and their handshakes and their rituals come out of Babylon through history to the present day. And satanic ritual, the sacrifice of children, etc. That comes out of Babylon. And people think, oh yeah, I accept it. Oh, that's went on, mate. But that were them, that were them are primitives. No, no. They are. They say, it's primitives. Yeah, I'll give you that. But it's primitives alive today, you see on CNN and the news. And through, they have carried this structure, so they have dictated through all these apparently unconnected areas of society, um, the same uh, agenda, which is what they think they're going to complete in our lifetimes. And so, as we have, they have made this journey, so they have, their symbolism from Babylon has come with them, which is why you see it all around us. All these symbols of secret societies and stuff, or the funny handshakes, go back to Babylon. That is the origin of the necktie. You know, oh, you, you, you must be properly dressed, put a tie on. That's where it comes from. It's the noose around your neck. What you have in the, the, the great Christian cathedrals of Europe, you see black and white squares 
on the on the floor. What is, what, what's this, this about black and white squares? I mean, was it a good deal? They get they buy a big lot of them and what? Because <laughs> it just so happens that in Freemasonic temples and in secret society temples going back to Babylon, they always have black and white squares on the floor. And you see so many policemen all around the world have black and white squares on their uniform. Now, I've heard an ugly rumor, I don't believe it, that somehow Freemasonry manipulates the police force. I think it's just a silly story. I don't believe it. I think, it's, I think they're all very fair and they don't arrest some people and let others go because that's the way the system works. But, again, you look at all these apparently different areas, and of course, Christianity, oh no, not Freemasonry, oh no. And yet, they're just different strands of the same knowledge. What actually happened from Babylon is that original um, hoarded knowledge has gone bang, Freemasonry, bang, Christianity, bang, Judaism, bang, secret societies, and, and, all, and all these different um, uh, parts of our society today actually come from the same source. They're laughing at us, but not for long. Now this is classic, the, the Babylonian trinity. In Babylon they worshipped the trinity of Nimrod, who also became known as Baal, Queen Samiramis, the mother goddess, also known as um, Easter, apparently was how it was produced, Easter is where Easter comes from, and the third point of the Babylonian trinity was the virgin son, Tammuz, a um, mirror image of the story of Jesus. Now what <laughs> happened is when uh, Samiramis was supposed to have been the mother of Nimrod and then married him and stuff like that, and when Nimrod died, Queen Samiramis, the goddess of Babylon, um, decreed that he would uh, be symbolized as the sun. She said he'd gone to the sun and became known as Baal, the sun god. And she claimed that she had been uh, miraculously impregnated by the rays of the sun, Nimrod, and gave birth to a virgin son, Tammuz, who was a reincarnation of Nimrod, therefore father and son were one. I've heard that somewhere before. Give us a clue. And so all through the ancient world, you'll find the um, focus on the sun. In, in often it's symbolizing um, Nimrod. This is uh, Sri Lankan. Um, and this is uh, Roman. And one of the ways they symbolized the sun was as a lion. The royal animal, the king of the jungle, the king of the solar system with the long mane, the rays of the sun. This is a, a throne from the Roman Empire. And so you'll see the lion all over British um, heraldry and royalty and stuff like that. Symbolizes the sun, symbolizes uh, Nimrod, the god of Babylon. On the side of that Freemasonic headquarters in Boston, the sun. Again, all these different apparently unconnected areas of our society are controlled by the same force and come from the same knowledge. Now one of the ways that they symbolized Nimrod was as the fish god, who they called him, or one of the names they called him was Dagon. And this is how um, they um, portrayed him, Dagon, symbolically. Well, I'll be Dagon. <laughs> When they moved to Rome, they used the same symbolism. The Roman church is just the church of Babylon. This guy turned his toes up like with a, the fish head on his hat. And so you'll see the symbolism of Nimrod in um, the military and stuff. Nimrod aircraft and various other things. Nimrod and Osiris were the same deity. It's interesting that what they, what they said about Nimrod was that when he died, Queen Samiramis found all parts of him except the willy, symbolic of the bloodline, I guess. And in, uh, in uh, Egypt, they said that the wife of Osiris, Isis, who was Egypt's version of Samiramis, um, um, it, she found every part of Osiris except um, the willy. I mean, it's just a recurring story. Um, Queen Samiramis 
was known as, also as Easter, which is where we get Easter from. The Christian festival comes from Babylon. And uh, Queen Semiramis, uh, this is the uh, Easter Ishtar Gate, the rebuilt one in Babylon now. And you find this lady, who was a real goddess uh, symbol of the Illuminati, um, everywhere. This is an original Babylonian piece of artwork with um, Ishtar, the, the Babylonian goddess, and she is protected by the owls, which will become very significant before we get to lunch. Now, what we're looking at, again, is the same knowledge expressing itself in different ways, different names. What they said about Queen Semiramis was she was the virgin mother of Tamos. What they said about Isis is that she was the virgin mother of Horus. When they moved to um, Rome and created the Roman church, they turned Mother Mary into a deity, and what do they call Mother Mary? The Virgin Mother and the Queen of Heaven. It's just a front for the knowledge, and they've sold the people a cover story called a religion. This is a, uh, an image of how they used to portray Queen Semiramis Easter in Babylon. That's how they portray Mother Mary and Jesus to this day. That's how they portrayed Isis and Horus. That's how they portray Mother Mary in an English church not far from me. Semiramis, Isis, Mary, same uh, deity, different name as they went off into different areas. And the, the, the basic same knowledge is there. And they also talked about, uh, that we brought about the uh, image of the Black Madonna, because what they do at the Illuminati is they reverse everything. If something is white, they'll make it black. If something's black, they'll, ter they'll turn it white. If something is supposed to point up, they'll point it down. This is why the um, uh, most obvious um, symbol of Satanism is the reversed um, star pointing down. Again, in the, inside the uh, temple in Boston, the goddess, and this is the mother lodge of Freemasonry in London. This is where they launch Freemasonry into the American colonies. I think it, this was started in the uh, early 1700s, very much part of the manipulation of America. Now, they London is a big place. It's got endless streets. Where did they park the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry? Great Queen Street. What did they call Samirimus Easter in Babylon? The Great Queen. This is the background to all these apparently unconnected organizations. So when they said, oh, we, 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 we um, named Virginia after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. Well, first of all, Queen Elizabeth I was no more a virgin than Madonna. And secondly, it was the Virgin Queen of Babylon that it was named after. This is uh, the way, or one of the ways, they portrayed Queen Semiramis in Babylon. I've seen her somewhere before. The Statue of Liberty was given to New York by French Freemasons in Paris who knew what it really symbolized. Queen Semiramis, the Illuminati goddess from Babylon. The um, goddess of the French Republic from where the Statue of Liberty came is again the image of Semiramis. The goddess of Colombia, Semiramis. In Babylon they symbolized uh, Nimrod as a fish and they symbolized Semiramis Easter as a dove. Um, in, when they moved to Rome, they, they called her Venus Columba, Venus the dove. Still in French today, the word for dove is Columba. And that's why we have Columbia all over the place. Christopher Columbus, um, that wasn't his uh, real name, but he became known as Christopher Columbus. Columba, the dove, taking the branch into the Americas. The dove of the Babylonian goddess. So we have British Columbia, uh, District of Columbia, 
Columbia Pictures, Columbia University, Columbia Broadcasting. On the uh, note paper of the Supreme Council of the Freemasonry Movement in Great Britain, the Dove. On British royalty, uh, the sticks that she holds, septics or scepters or something, I don't know what you bloody call, it, call them, um, the Dove. That oh, makes me bloody laugh, you know. You know when you're, you, you, you're in, a, in a room with a queen, you, 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 the staff and stuff, they have to go out like that. So, so the queen don't see her back, you know. She probably only th thinks people only have fronts. <laughs> I mean, what are we doing? Oh, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I guess when I talked about satanic rituals at Balmoral Castle, I've lost my knighthood, have I? Do you reckon I have? Do you reckon I've lost it? I think I probably have. When um, Nimrod died, it was decreed that he would, like Tammuz, because he and Tammuz were one, father and son, would be symbolized from then on with a flame or a torch, the symbol of Nimrod. So we have Queen Semiramis holding the torch of Nimrod. It's all Babylonian symbolism, and it's all the same network. This is... Uh, the Statue of Liberty, right next to the River Seine, in fact, on an island in the River Seine in Paris. Mirror image. Because what happened is, as those bloodlines moved out of Babylon into Europe, they took the symbolism with them and, and dropped it off. And then when they went to the Americas, they took the same symbolism. That's why you see it in both places. Um, when they killed Kennedy in Dealey Plaza, just um, down from where he, he was shot, um, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry uh, put up a uh, obelisk, another ancient symbol, the, the, uh, the um, phallic symbol, the bloodline symbol, uh, and on top they put the flame of Nimrod. We did it, we're telling you, but you can't see it, can you? On Kennedy's grave, in Arlington Cemetery, the flame of Nimrod. They, they use things like, it's the eternal flame. Oh, please. Um, on, on the place of the Pont d'Alma Tunnel, where people take their tributes to Diana, where she died in the set-up car crash, you have a massive and exact replica of the flame um, held by the Statue of Liberty. So, and the, the candle was also used to symbol, uh, symbolize uh, Nimrod in Babylon. And so we come to Samos, the mirror image of Jesus. If you want a son of God who died so our sins could be forgiven um, and uh, was born on December 25th, well, take your pick. Uh, there are a stream of them all over the place. On the left is Horus, on the right is Jesus, and uh, we also had Tammuz, who was the, uh, one of the original models in Babylon. Um, Horus... Uh, and Jesus. Jesus was the light of the world. Horus was the light of the world. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Horus said he was the truth, the life. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Horus was born in Anu, the place of bread. Jesus was the good shepherd. Horus was the good shepherd. Seven fishers brought a boat with Jesus. Seven people brought a boat with Horus. Jesus was the lamb. Horus was the lamb. Jesus identified, uh, was identified with a cross. Horus is identified with a cross. Jesus was baptized at 30, Horus was baptized at 30. Jesus was the child of a virgin, Mary Horus was the child of a virgin, Isis. The birth of Jesus was marked by a star, the birth of Horus was marked by a star. Jesus was the child teacher in the temple, Horus was the child teacher in the temple. Jesus had 12 disciples, Horus had 12 followers. Jesus was the morning star, Horus was the morning star. Jesus was the Christ, Horus was the Christ. Jesus was tempted on a mountain by Satan. Horus was tempted on a mountain by set. By set. Do you reckon there's some uh, connection there? Um, do you reckon? I don't know. I, I, my, my jury's out. <laughs> same knowledge, same control. This is Mithra, who was said to have been born on December the 25th and died at what we call Easter. This was a deity worshipped uh, in the Roman Empire and was basically uh, replaced in the Roman Empire 
by uh, the worship of Jesus. And the reason people moved from Mithra to Jesus so seamlessly is apart from the name, nothing seemed to have changed to them. And of course, the cover story religion and the cover story book, that holds the people here so they don't get into multidimensional infinite consciousness and ask questions. Mustn't ask questions. God doesn't want us to know. So Jesus was the light of the world. Yes, the sun. Jesus is coming back on a cloud. Yes, the sun. Coming back tomorrow morning, actually. This is where the, the symbolism where a lot of this came from. The ancients, they used to um, symbolize uh, the year with a cross, creating the four seasons. I remember the four seasons, I'm old enough. Thank you, Valid, remember? <laughs> he used to sing like someone was holding something very tightly, do you remember? <laughs> cross, and they put the sun on the cross. Ooh! Matter starts working. Um, at this point was the winter solstice, and they said at this point that the sun was born. Um, because uh, in the northern hemisphere, the sun reaches the lowest point in its power on the winter solstice, December, to what, 21st, 22nd. Three days later is the 25th in our calendar. And that's when they said that the sun was born again and started its journey back to the peak of its power in the summer at the summer solstice. And one of the ways that they, and this is why, that so many, the vast majority of these uh, sun deities like Jesus and, and Mithra were given the birthday of December the 25th because it was the birthday of the sun, that one. And... Um, they used to symbolize the, the uh, cycle of the sun in relation to the earth as the life of a man going through the year. So he would be a baby here, become a big strapping strong man there the, at the summer solstice, and then would get uh, more and more weak and old and frail until he became like old father time here. Now, one of the ways that they symbolized the sun at the peak of the power of this man-sun symbolism was with long golden hair symbolizing the rays of the sun at the peak of their power in the summer. I've just told the story of Samson. Because what happened in the Samson story is as Samson came down into the house of Virgo the Virgin, the house of Delilah, his hair was cut as the rays of the sun got less powerful and he lost his strength. It's all symbolism which they say, no, literal, literal, take it literal, cover story. Real background esoteric symbolism. Esoteric knowledge, public religion. And so you have this symbol all over the place of the sun um, in that symbol I've just been showing you. This is all around the square uh, where the Ritz Hotel is in Paris, where Diana uh, left, of course, on her journey uh, to her assassination. This is the symbol of NATO, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Illuminati and a stepping stone to their world government. The sun and the cross. This is the symbol of the CIA, another expression of the sun cult controlled by these people. The cross and the sun on the cross. Uh, this is uh, in a financial building right next to St Paul's Cathedral in the city of London. The city of London, what is now known as the financial district or the square mile where the, the, uh, all the banking system comes out of in the Bank of England, that is one of the real major heart centers of manipulation of this planet um, in terms of the secret societies of the Illuminati. And um, St. Paul's Cathedral is right in the heart of that. And across the road is this, and there you see the same symbol, the black sun, reverse symbolism, but basically the same as what I'm talking about. And it, when they built the cities, because the, the symbolism is staggering in terms of its detail, when they built the cities, they put these symbols in the cities, their major uh, centers of control. This is Paris and the Arc de Triomphe. 
And this is um, one of the major uh, centers of the, the street plan of Paris, which is a, a big, big Illuminati center. There are 12 streets going off from the circle, and the arch is very much Freemasonic symbolism. That's why you have the Royal Arch of Freemasonry, etc. And in terms of Paris, they've even gone so far as to put the sun on the road. And this is known as the, the star um, circle. And if you um, look at the cross in the circle, they've even done that. A lot of the, the great artists and writers, some of them not for malevolent reasons, um, put this uh, knowledge, secret knowledge, into um, their paintings and their writings. This is Leonardo da Vinci's famous uh, picture, The Last Supper, in which he's symbolizing that symbol again. He symbolized Jesus as the sun. What they used to do, the ancients, is they used to put a halo around the deity that symbolized the sun to symbolize that it was a sun deity and not a real person. So that's where the halo comes from. And what um, uh, da Vinci has done, who was a secret society initiate, and it's one of the reasons he had so many uh, advanced thoughts and advanced uh, predictions um, that have uh, come to pass, um, he's broken up the twelve disciples into four sets of three. Uh, again, it's that symbol, um, symbolizes as a painting. I mean, why is it that all these bloody deities have twelve followers? Why do we have King Arthur and the twelve knights of the round table? The sun, the uh, astrological circle, the months of the year, that's the symbolism of it uh, in part. And actually at the entrance to that Freemasonic temple where I was sat in the, in the chair um, is that picture which uh, Freemasons would understand what it uh, means. And again, there's a, a depiction of Bell, the, the god Bell, the sun god Bell, uh, on an ancient standing stone. There's the halo. That's what they used to do. That's where it comes from. So we have the phonetic use of this symbolism also with the Liberty Bell, Bell Baal, and the, um, the rising sun. Uh, Horus was known as the rising sun. Um, who rose in the morning at the start of a new day. Uh, so Nimrod was also symbolized as the rising sun. And we talk about Christ has risen. Yeah, the sun has risen. Uh, this is why you get uh, the house of the rising sun coming up again and again. Phoenix, the rising sun, the sun coming back um, from the dark place. Uh, George Washington on his uh, famous sun chair had this symbol, the rising sun, Horus, Nimrod being a high Freemason, knowing exactly what it symbolized. In that Freemasonic temple in Boston, the rising sun. You'll see this um, coming up again and again. You'll see it coming up again and again. I like it. Um, especially around here. It's hot, isn't it, this time of year? So in Illinois and a lot of the other uh, states, you'll see the sun coming up over the horizon. I mean, Illinois is not famous for its sunshine. Um, and so you, you, you have, again, the recurring theme. Now... You've got to have it in close-up to realize um, what this is. This is above Downing Street. Tony Blair's home currently. But what are the chances of that? Look, that. The rising sun, and it's even got the rays of it, the same as the sun chair of George Washington. And there's NBC News. Because... You see this recurring symbolism in these different organizations in the modern world, what we call the modern world, because they are symbols that all these different, apparently different organizations are controlled by the same force. It's a secret language. The Mormon church around in Salt Lake City and stuff, you find the rising sun and the reversed satanic symbol. Look. These are all, as the Rolling Stones said, bridges to Babylon and so is the control that's expanded more and more. Christmas um, it goes back to Babylon and that period um, and you look at uh, Santa, Santa uh, Claus um, it, it uh, is a symbol for Satan, Santa, Satan um, the um, tree the um, 
Christmas tree um, is a symbol of Tammuz and Nimrod for various uh, mythological reasons. Um, the Yule log goes back to Babylon, the child log. Um, Ishtar, Ishtar um, said that she came to earth from the moon in an egg. That's why we have the Ishtar, Ishtar egg. Um, Tammuz was uh, famous in the Babylonian uh, myths for being fond of rabbits. That's why we have the Easter bunny, the Easter bunny. In Babylon, they used to um, eat uh, buns with a T cross on them. Um, Tammuz was said to have been killed by a boar, a pig. And so from that time, it was decreed that they would eat ham at the uh, commemoration of his death, Easter, ever um, from that point forward. That's why we have the Easter ham. The period of the Christian Lent was the same period of the um, commemoration of the death of Tammuz decreed by Semiramis in the Babylonian myths. Everywhere you see the same thing and what it's symbolizing is the same point of control. Other secret codes of the Illuminati, the skull and bones. This is a Freemasonic apron from the 1800s. Um, when the Templars were arrested in France and, and what have you, they were accused of using the skull and bones in their rituals. Um, and it comes right through to the present day. That's why the most infamous secret society in America is called the Skull and Bones Society. It came out of Germany originally. This takes in bloodline students, I think it's 15 every year, and the ratio of them that become significant players in American uh, society and American government, either behind the camera or in front of it, is uh, far, far, far higher than the general student population of the country. And um, one of the key families of the Skull and Bones Society is the Bush family. Prescott Bush, the grandfather, Skull and Bones, Father Bush, Skull and Bones, and Boy Bush, Skull and Bones. In fact, um, the last election was a classic of its kind. There are, like I said earlier, apparently, I don't know now, they the, the, so they tell me, about 280 million Americans at the present time. At any point, there are a few hundred members of the Skull and Bone Society alive at any one time. What are the statistical chances of two initiates of the Skull and Bone Society running against each other for president? But that's what happened in 2004. And both were asked once only, um, I think it was on uh, PBS, um, by a sycophantic interviewer, where shall I look, sir, about the Skull and Bones membership, he said it was too secret to talk about, and then the interviewer changed the subject. I mean, you're an interviewer. What do you mean? What do you mean it's too secret to talk about? You ought to be president. You are president. Don't tell me you, 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 that, that your secret society is too secret to talk about. He said the same, basically, and the same interviewer changed the subject. The Skull and Bones uh, is a massive manipulator of American uh, politics. And this is why, you know, American presidents are not elected by ballot. They are selected by blood and selected by money and secret society uh, networks. There you go. Vote for me. That's what it is. Unbelievable. Now this is, uh, of course, a classic uh, Illuminati symbol going way, way back. The um, uh, pyramid and all-seeing eye. And that is on the dollar bill. It was put there in 1933 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt from the De Molay, uh secret society. And there's a massive Freemason, and here we go. And uh, basically what that says is that... Uh, writing is uh, he favors our undertaking new order of the ages a new world order is one of the code words for this um, control agenda and um, they've stopped using that so much since Father George was using it all the time and then when people started pointing out new world order that's the code they don't use it so much now 
uh, very rarely hear it. And so you see advertisements with the uh, all-seeing eye and the pyramid all over the place. Uh, when the uh, Pentagon came out with this organization to um, put propaganda out about what was happening in Iraq and the, the invasion and all the rest of it and the war on terrorism, the Information Awareness Office, my goodness me, is that Orwellian or not? Um, look what they chose for the symbol. The looking over the world, the all-seeing eye, the all-seeing eye, the top of the pyramid of control. This is the symbol of British intelligence. MI5. There you go. The pyramid, there's the eye. Like I said earlier, the, uh, and by the way, that fleur-de-lis is a, 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 a Merovingian symbol. Like I said earlier, when you get to the top of these organizations, Mossad, British intelligence, the CIA, they merge. They're a global organization. This is MI6, again, the building next to the Thames, the feel of the uh, pyramid with the capstone missing. This is Dealey Plaza, the street plan, Dealey Plaza where Kennedy was killed. And if someone said to me, um, without knowing all the rest of it, look at that, that's significant, I'd say, well, come on, mate. You know, there are coincidences, don't go mad. But when you do uh, the research into this year after year, the obsession with symbolism is um, extraordinary. This was actually the site of the first Freemasonic temple in Dallas. Sacred place or important place, uh, the Trinity um, area of um, Dallas, Dealey Plaza. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, CBS, the all-seeing eye looking at you. CBS, NBC, same controlling force. Um, this is the uh, Salt Lake City, the Mormons, the all-seeing eye. And then you've got the, the obelisk, which is symbolic of the phallic symbol, the bloodline, genetics. Um, and of course, we've got the biggest one in the world, stone one in the world, in the Washington Memorial. In fact, there's a bigger dick just over here in the house. <laughs> Um, and you've got the church spire. These are all manifestations of the same thing. That's the uh, Washington Freemasonic Memorial there. Again, the same thing recurring. And so, when you look at the, like the Allies in the Second World War, fighting the enemy, the Nazis, it looks different from this perspective. Yes, fighting two sides, ooh, controlled by the same people. So you've got this Nazi, he's won the bloody lottery, this bloke, look at him. He's got the, he's got the uh, Maltese cross, he's got the uh, skull and bones, he's got the uh, swastika symbol going way back that the Illuminati use, and he's got the eagle, which is an expression, a symbol of the phoenix, the sun re-emerging. And the symbolism is not just there to... Uh, you know, take the mick or anything, it's there for a reason, and some of it is there because it affects us in terms of law. When I first came to um, America, what I couldn't work out is if I was in a federal building, or I saw a court on the television, or I, I spoke in a school once, the American flag had a gold fringe round it. Why? I've, that's not got the American flag, it's not got a gold fringe round it, but all these federal ones have. And I realized years later, that it's to do with the international law of the flags. In the ancient times, when they used to trade with, um, in ships, uh, with ships and stuff, and still today, the flag flying on the ship when you entered it depicted the law you were accepting you would come under by entering the ship flying that flag. What the buggers have done is brought that law ashore. So now when you enter a building, you are accepting the law of the flag being flown on that building. Now they don't tell us, this is why, when you look at the courts of America, behind the bloody judge, the American flag has a gold fringe round it. What's it mean? A gold fringe means that you are 
accepting the jurisdiction of British maritime law, commercial law, the law of contract, and you are accepting that any constitutional rights you have do not apply in that place with that flag. This is just some of the background to the detail of the scam. On the soldiers in Iraq, why in their uniforms do they have an American flag with a gold fringe round it? Because they are not there for America, constitutional America. They are there for the corporation that controls America, masquerading as the American government. In the streets of uh, Washington, because they, they started with a blank sheet of land in Washington, they went mad. Um, the um, reversed star there, five-pointed star, um, the satanic symbol, uh, symbol, that's at the entrance to the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in London. And um, you'll find that again, the satanic symbol, um, in um, the Mormon uh, church network in Salt Lake City because it is a satanic organization. Although the vast majority of people who are Mormons have no idea. They are sold the public religion and they don't know about the real background to it. I was taken around Salt Lake City by two lovely uh, uh, girls who had paid to come from Hong Kong and Thailand. They'd saved up for years to come to take people around and try to convert them to the Mormon religion and paid for it with their own money and I just said they were lovely and I said to them at one point I said can you explain to me if there's any significance of Joseph Smith and um, the founders being Freemasons and one of them said to me what's a Freemason that's how it's done And so, um, this is uh, from a, a book called Talisman of the United States, which looks at all the esoteric symbolism in, in the Washington Street Plan. This is um, uh, the uh, White House. This is the uh, Congress building. Um, oh, sorry, the other way around. This is the White House, the Congress building. And in the Street Plan, you have the same satanic uh, reversed pentagram. What um, they do to symbolize the negative is either reverse it, that's why you have the reverse pentagram, or they distort a symbol so it's no longer in balance. And if you go through there, that's 16th Street, around there, uh, you find a very strange building in Washington, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, what, what the thing I was going to mention is the center of a pentagram is a pentagon, and that's why we have the head, uh, headquarters of the American military as the pentagon. Um, so, like I said, just about here, you find a strange building in Washington. Here it is. It's like something out of ancient Egypt or Greece or that kind of uh, period. Um, and behind there is our old friend, the sun coming up over the horizon. Horus, Tamos, Nimrod. And this is the supreme headquarters, 33rd degree Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The idea that Freemasonry started in what the 1600s, 1700s and took over from the old Masonic guilds is total crap. It's just another name for a strand of control and manipulation going right back from the, to the ancient world. Again, inside that Boston Masonic headquarters, on the wall is this picture. They don't think they go back to the 1600s, 1700s. They come through from the ancient world, uh, putting people in positions of power and influence to control society, friend to friend, from centuries past to centuries to come. Oh, I don't think so. Again, the Rosicrucians is a pyramid. There's lots of people involved in the Rosicrucian organization who are seeking enlightenment, but it's another pyramidal organization that locks into the network. This um, Capitol Hill is not a political building. It is a secret society temple. And I've seen that somewhere before. Uh, yeah, that's where St. Paul's Cathedral in the heart of the city of London 
from which so much of American government and society is controlled. Now the reason they call it Capitol Hill, and you see Capitol Hill a lot around America, it comes from um, in uh, the time that the Illuminati were in, in control in Rome, headquartered in Rome, it comes from Capitoline Hill, which was a sacred place for the Illuminati in terms of their rituals and initiations and their secret society network at the time they were headquartered in Rome. Rome, by the way, in the Vatican is still enormously important in the web, um, right there at the spider center. Um, but that's where Capitol Hill comes from. It's all symbolism. And before we have um, a bit of lunch, I just want to bring, bring this in. Because these three things um, all connect. And they all come back to the same force again. As I was saying earlier, um, it's, it's so difficult for people who watch the news and get their information from the mainstream to comprehend that children in their own neighborhoods could be being sacrificed in rituals. But the thing that staggered me as I started to research this in detail was not that it was going on, but the scale of it is staggering and the kind of people involved in it. The people we see on the news, the people that stand up and pontificate about peace and caring about people. See, when you're sacrificing children, you have no problem with dropping bombs on civilians in Iraq. It just doesn't enter the empathy equation. Because there is no empathy. And this is what these guys are involved in. And of course, not a million miles from here is a place called Bohemian Grove. This is the Russian River. It's not Russian there, but there are times of the year when it does. Uh, the Russian River, and behind those trees are, I think it's 2,700 acres of redwood forest, a playground for the elite called Bohemian Grove. Go down that road and there you go. It's a place where the elite go to take part in grotesque rituals and many other things. Now, again, Bohemian Grove will be a pyramid. There'll be members of Bohemian Grove, a lot of them that go at certain times of the year, who are not involved in this stuff. But the elite go at certain times when they bloody well are involved in it. And it's interesting how the faces turn up. This is a guy called Glenn Seaborg, who was involved in the development of plutonium. Thank you, Glenn. Great gift to the world. Much appreciated. Speaking at Bohemian Grove in 1957. Who is it sitting next to him? Oh, it's Uncle Ron. And who's this? Tricky bloody dicky. <laughs> Two people from massively different walks of life, one at this time a B-movie actor getting on and off his horse, and the other one a soon-to-be career politician, taking on Kennedy in the 60 election, if that was a career politician already. And they both are there at Bohemian Grove, and both go on to be presidents of the United States in a country where anyone can be president. This is what's going on in the background. And what do they do at Bohemian Grove? Well, they have rituals, and the main focus of the ritual is a 40-foot sudden stone owl. And there's people in the hoods and the bloody gowns doing these Babylonian bloody rituals and then coming away and running the transnational corporations and deciding to bomb Iraq. This is um, some filming done by a guy called Alex Jones who uh, does a lot of gr uh, great work down in um, Texas getting this stuff out. And he got in there and he, he put it in a hidden camera. Uh, the opening ritual, cremation of care they call it, 
And over here are the, the onlookers, the grovers. Then there's the lake, and here's the people doing the ritual. And uh, it's a better picture of it. Now, these are the people that were running our bloody world. And what happened in this uh, ritual, and it was, uh, there's a video, you can get the video, is um, eventually a, a kind of a raft is floated in here with a body on it. Now, they say it's a, a, an effigy. I don't know either way, because my information is that the sacrifice and stuff goes on in much smaller elite groups, not in front of the, all of them, but who knows? They say it's an effigy. They then... Um, pick the effigy up, they put it on that bloody altar in front of the 40 foot stone owl and they set it alight. And whether it's an effigy or not, the sound on the, the Jones um, recording is particularly good, um, beamed out on loudspeakers. Um, when they set fire to this effigy, uh, this massive blood curdling scream of agony comes out of the loudspeakers. Now, one of two things happening here. Either it's not an effigy, or they've actually gone to the trouble of recording a blood-curdling, horrific scream to play as part of the ritual. E either way, these are running our world, these people. And they have, they, they have any em empathy uh, problem with slaughtering civilians, it's a blood fest to them. So it's, it's a mass ritual, sacrifice. And the symbol of the Bohemian Club is the owl. One of the uh, ways that Samiramis Ishtar, Ishtar is symbolized by name is as Lilith. There's the one version of her and there's that original Babylonian piece of artwork for the Babylonian goddess. And she is protected by the owls. How interesting that I should find this in the street plan of Washington around the Capitol building. All I've done is draw a line around the, the street uh, road system within the Capitol complex. And it is an unmistakable owl. This next one I've done nothing to. It's a picture from a Washington tourist map that you can buy anywhere in Washington. And there it is. The owl sitting on the pyramid with the Congress building in its belly. Egg, exactly. When's Wheel of Fortune on, honey? Good to know. <laughs> all over. All over Washington. It's just a massive esoteric symbolism. Now, Georgie, George Washington, um, they decided they, they, they needed um, to have a, a, what do you call it, of him. And um, so they decided to have it done in um, Italy, not America, this statue. That's the word I was searching for. And when they unveiled it, there's George, our esteemed first president, um, naked from the waist up. He's Bill Clinton, he's covered with a piece of cloth. One arm up, one arm down. And people were going, what's that about? Why, why, why do you put George like that? Well, maybe that's why. This is the Bapomet combination symbol of the negative force used in Satanism and worshipped in satanic ritual. That's another amazing coincidence, isn't it? My goodness. The veil is lifting. Now this is the symbol of the, quote, devil used by Satanists. Um, some people say, oh no, that uh, that's also means I love you. No, that means I love you with a thumb out in uh, sign language. Thumb not out means the devil to Satanists. Oh! Mind you, that's just a coincidence. Got to be. 
they say what's to do is the hanging horns which said some football team or something in Texas, oh please. There we go. There you go. Go on, Georgie. Now, if it's about Texas flipping sports team, what about these buggers? <laughs> Does bloody Homeland Security Ridge support them? An idiot quail? Does um, Berlusconi, leader of Italy, my goodness me, they get a good crowd, don't they? <laughs> And, and all connected to this, it's one of the things that, that, that you find it so, such a common theme. These bloodlines have an obsession with sex with children and sexual abuse of children. And all over the world there are children being taken out of society through various organizations, um, official organizations and child support help organizations and taken into the network of child abuse by some of the most famous people in America. And the names of which I, 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 uh, I name a stream of them in my books, and so they bloody should be. Now, why don't we know more about this? Well, that's what journalists, journalists think. But one of the most destructive combinations is arrogance and ignorance, and that's what yet you, you find in honorable exceptions, but most mainstream journalists, they're ignorant of what's going on because they don't do any research. They think research is watching CNN on the newsroom telly and reading the morning papers, but they're arrogant enough to think that if it was going on they'd know about it because they were journalists. Um, and the reason, uh, another thing that people say is, well, if it was going on on that scale, we'd know about it. Well, maybe we wouldn't because of this. Like I said earlier, you don't have to control many positions to control the system. You only have to control the key positions. You don't have to control everyone in social services to stop an investigation into a famous person abusing your children. You have to control those levels of social services that decide if the investigation is going to go ahead or not. You don't have to control every policeman. There's a lot of genuine policemen. A lot of genuine policemen. A lot of genuine people in the CIA. A lot of genuine people throughout the system who think they're serving their country. But they do not are not aware of how they're being played like a violin. And so you don't have to control every policeman, you have to control that level of the police that decides what's investigated and what isn't. And if it comes to court, you control the judges, you control the courts, you control the coroners, you control the doctors who do the examinations so that they don't find sexual abuse. This is why how it doesn't come out. And one of the, the, the uh, key reasons or, or another reason why they are into abuse of children, not just sexual abuse, but violent abuse, is because they have turned out millions and millions of mind-controlled people using something called trauma-based mind control. And this was really developed, I mean, it goes back to Babylon, this. All they were doing it then, they understood how it worked. But it was really developed in, in more recent times in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany, through people like Joseph Mengele, another bloody expression of this gang, um, when they started to realize how they could use this mechanism of the mind which shuts out the memory of extreme trauma. Like when you have a big car accident, a horrible car accident, you can't remember the impact, and often it's quite a time bef before and after. Because what the mind does is it puts an amnesic barrier around the memory. Good, we don't want to keep consciously uh, remembering that. But they realized that if you could systematically um, traumatize people, particularly children, if you start before the age of five and six, before all the pathways are, are, are formed, you could turn their mind into a honeycomb of self-contained barriers, which they call altars. Now, each of these altars thinks it's the whole mind. And through hypnotic keys and trigger keys and various hypnotic um, methods, they create what they call a front altar. That is the... the, the, the personality that expresses itself to the world, that people around them think is that person. But in the back of the mind are all these other altars in the subconscious mind. What they do is they program these altars with uh, orders, like assassination, assassinating people. Why is it all these people that assassinate um, 
uh, people and, and mass kill at just the right time for the agenda to manipulate are often lone nutters because they're um, part of this mind control operation. And they put the instructions into the back altar and then with a trigger word or a trigger sound, anything, that whatever's programmed in there, the front altar changes places with the back programmed altar and the back altar becomes the conscious mind which carries out the assassination or whatever. And the, what they do with children is they use the back altars to bring forward to the front for the period that they are sexually abused by these famous, famous people all over the world. One of them's just died, um, uh, Ted Heath, former Prime Minister of Britain. And um, when, it's, when it's over, they then push that altar back into the subconscious mind. The front altar comes forward. It doesn't even know it's ever met that person, never mind being abused by him. And more and more people, as they, they get older, these uh, fragments of mind are starting to, the barriers are starting to break and they're starting to remember in photographic detail what happened to them. And it's photographic detail because the mind is so focused at times of extreme trauma. This is um, another picture that, I, uh, that was taken, uh, my wife Pam took it in um, the Freemasonic Temple in Boston of uh, Walt Disney. Disney! Give us your mind, kids. Give us your reality. How many characters do you reckon there are in that circle? I give up. Twelve, of course there are. From the international de Marley Corden. Walt Disney, Disney. Get their minds as kids. You get their minds as adults. Fill them with crap in their food and drink. Fast food, chemical pop so their minds do not manifest their true uh, magnificence. And then we say, oh, we've got such a problem with childhood behavior, give him another Coke. <laughs> and if he don't change, give him some Ritalin. Our children are being targeted on the most monumental scale because these buggers know the awakening is coming and they are desperate to shut it down which says something about us. This guy, um, Edgar Hoover, and he should know, said, the individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. And that is this manipulation conspiracy's greatest defense. Because of the way it is orchestrated information, the difference between what is going on in the world and what we're told is going on is such a chasm that when people see the truth, they often go, oh, do me a favor, you're having a laugh. But more and more, it's here. And we ain't having a laugh. But, as we'll get into this afternoon, this is a reality.